Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Rabbi Hannah Estrin. She is an engaging tour guide and a rabbi who lives in Jerusalem, an avid educator exploring the intersection of text, spirituality, and Israel. She now works as an online educational facilitator, and she believes in the power of deep and honest conversations. Rabbi Estrin, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Ben. It's nice to see you and to have heard so many wonderful voices this evening. You're right, it's 1130, so I've already seen the sunrise and taken a nap, and I'm here joining you before I head off to, uh, to lunch, actually. So good morning to everyone. Whatever time of the morning it is, it's uh, quiet and sunny here in Jerusalem. What I thought that we would do, since it is kind of that time of the middle of the night where energy starts to get a little low, I wanted to bring and share some of the history of Shavuot here in Jerusalem specifically and more commonly in Israel as a whole. So going back about of 100 years and then bringing us forward until today. So great, thank you for uh, screen sharing there. Um, starting back, if we can actually go ahead and go to the next one. And this is a lot of this is really my own experiences here in Jerusalem and experiences that I've had as a tour guide taking those pilgrims that come to visit around the country and seeing for themselves what this country is built on. So just kind of going backwards in time a little bit, we have talked about over the course of this evening, Chagabi Korim, Shavuot as the festival of the first fruits, and the concept that what is Shavuot is the end of this period of counting after Pesach, but it's also this time of bringing the yield of our fields and being back in the land of the Israel, of Israel. This is these are the fields that we're talking about are here in the land of Israel and the animals and such that we're doing. So if we can go ahead and go to the next slide. Starting with the early 1900s, these are a few of the posters that were published early in the 1900s, primarily by Jewish National Fund, Karen Kayemet, but not in, in uh, not exclusively by them. And I really wanted to focus on this last one, even though they really all give us an idea of what was going on, but this one really shows a lot. In the background, you have this sparse settlement of homes, possibly kibbutz or moshav here in the land. And then in the foreground, we have all of these kids. When we are talking about the early 1900s, we really have a black and white picture of what's going. Now, in Israel, nothing is ever black and white. It is complicated to say the least. Every conversation we have is complicated. But you had two basic types of Jews living here. You had religious Jews and you had secular Jews. And yes, there were overlaps and, co and conflicts and connections between all of these. But Sukkot really was the holiday of the secular Jew, the holiday of the kibbutz. So if you look at the girl who is leading this parade, okay, parade being the operative word here, because every kibbutz, every moshav, every community brought together their kids, particularly everyone dressed in white, and they would have a parade. And she's leading, she's got the Israeli flag there, she's got her basket of first fruits. The second and third kid, they are both carrying baby animals, the best of their animals. Oh, and then you have Joshua and Kalev, the symbol of modern day tourism, but the symbol of going into Israel. And while recognizing the difficulties of Israel, also recognizing the beauties and the amazing things that this is the land of milk and honey. So they're carrying their large grapes behind them and then followed up by more children. And this really was what would center around Israel and the concepts of Shavuot for several decades. Go ahead to the next set. And to give you a taste of the real concept, these are actually pictures from the 50s. You've got on a kibbutz in a field which has already been plowed because now is when we're plowing some of our first fields. You've got kids, again, dressed in white. Look at the shorts. Okay, look at the sandals. Classic early, pre-state, early state Israel out on a bale of hay. They're, they're actually standing around a wagon. Go ahead to the next one. 
a little bit more recently after that. We're not using wagons so much, we're gonna to graduate to tractors. One of the most amazing things that will happen at some kibbutzim even today is the babies who are born this year, they are put on the tractor on Shavuot. And that is their first tractor, right? That the connection to the land is so strong that they get their first tractor, right? And here's just another picture of what is going on at one of the kibbutzim, the goat wasn't really being so cooperative here. He wanted to uh, have some of the fruits and vegetables that were being on display. This, this was actually part of a series of pictures and you can see the kids kind of relating to that large goat as he was not cooperating with what he was supposed to do. So really taking Shavuot as this harvest festival and celebrating the harvest festival, celebrating the kids, celebrating the new births and such. But there's also another side to this. And if we go to the next slide, this is the slide, the part that perhaps we're more familiar with because we're doing it right now, is this concept of tikkun lil shavuot. And one of the things that's said about this whole concept of why do we study all night is that the Israelites didn't get up from a tantora. They overslept. And in order to prevent us from oversleeping, we are going to make sure we just stay up all night and wait for sunrise, which right now it was about 5.30, 5.20 this morning. So sunrise is pretty early. Sleep over sleeping sunrise is not such an unreasonable thing to do. Next slide. Um, then what happens in Jerusalem specifically, can we go ahead one, is over the course of the night, you have the day before, it was in yesterday's newspaper, there's a list of who's doing learning. And the week before, the two weeks before, all of these different locations put out publications of what's going on. And this is a night in Jerusalem where you're walking around the streets all night long. In Tel Aviv, we call this Laila Levan. Usually Laila Levan, white night, is referring to an all-night party. This is kind of Jerusalem's version of Laila Levan, where you might start at six o'clock at one place and by four o'clock in the morning, you've ventured to seven other places to see what their learning is about, to meet people. I have two teenagers who are now sleeping it off. One of whom got home, I don't know, maybe about four o'clock in the morning and the other one got home after the sun actually came out, who had been all, all night with their friends doing exactly this thing. So it's a big evening of learning of schmoozing, of eating dairy products, of course, and you have to have, know where to go to get the best dairy products, which synagogues, which communities, which houses are all supplying the dairy products. So that's the, the more traditional side. But here in Israel, we also have a non-traditional side of Shavuot, which is newer and very exciting. Go ahead to the next slide. So I know that some of you are in the north and it's still freezing at night, but in Israel, we are well working our way into summer. And I would guess right now it's probably low 80s already. And by the time Shavuot rolls around, we are routinely getting into the 90 degrees. There is this concept that Torah is connected to water. Torah is the source of life. And it seems like somewhere in North Africa, we think this is an import from North Africa, they decided that we're going to make this concept of connecting Torah to water a little bit more active. And they had traditions that were surrounding this. And what happened when this came to Israel 
is that this was totally transformed into one of the world's largest water fights, essentially. So we're actually looking at Kikar Rabin in Tel Aviv in front of the city hall, where every year on Shovel morning, there's a water fight, but you can pretty much go anywhere. In fact, if you're walking down the streets, sometimes in certain neighborhoods, it's kind of known that you don't walk down the streets unless you want to get water ball bombed from the porches with kids like throwing water balloons over the sides of the porches and stuff. It's also a day where families may go to the beach, they may go do a water hike. So there's not lot, lots of different ways of connecting to this water part of the, the holiday. Um, and really saying this is the beginning of summer. It also, while we have just finished Sfirat uh, Omer, the counting of the Omer, Many of our kids now are, spirit, are counting Spirata Gomer, Gomer being the finishing. So they're counting days down toward the end of school. So Shavuot kind of is marking that transition from the spring into looking forward to summer, being finished with school, water, and all of those things that are so intricately connected to Israel. Okay, so that brings us to the next slide and to kind of the, the big topic here in Jerusalem. And what happened with the Western Wall? So up until 1948, the Western Wall, people would gather at the Western Wall for Shabbat, for holidays, but it wasn't a thing. And if you go back to the 1800s and the early 1900s, it really wasn't a thing. People went there for special occasions or they might go there if they had a, a, a very dire lamentation that we just heard about um, and needed to really have some depth in their prayer, they might go there. But what we were looking at was a very small space. And then 1967 comes. Next slide. 1967, the Six Day War, and we are going to return to the old city, we're going to conquer the old city, whatever language you want to use, and it's complicated. Every way that you can say this, there is pieces of that language that get intertwined in that. But we're going to return to the old city where we were in 1948 for the, for the sake of this conversation. Go ahead and click, please. And these are three photographs that most people are familiar with. On the left, the, the vertical photograph, we have Uzi Narkis, Moshe Dayan, Yitzhak Kavrabin, who are walking in to the Western Wall area. At the top, you've got the paratroopers with the Western Wall in the background. And at the bottom, you have Rabbi Shlomo Gorin, who is blowing the shofar at the Western Wall for the first time, they say, in 2,000 years. Now, under the British, we blew shofar almost every year at the Western Wall, but it was, a, it was not blown freely. It was actually this entire <coughs> almost unit of paramilitary, and their responsibility was to get a shofar to the Western Wall under the British in order to be able to blow it, knowing that they would be arrested because it wasn't legal. So Rabbi Shlomo Gorin, who had only recently blown this very same shofar in the Sinai Desert, kind of symbolically ending that piece of the war against Egypt, comes to Jerusalem with that same shofar, and he's going to blow that shofar at the Western Wall, as well as on the Temple Mount. But there's one more picture. Go ahead and click. And this is the picture that I love, that really speaks to me. Because here, it's that same day. You can just turn that down a little bit. Thanks. Um, we have everybody together dancing, who had gathered at the foot of the Western Wall. You've got the ultra-Orthodox man with the black coat and the hat. Not right-wing ultra-Orthodox, but very religious. You've got the soldiers in there. You've got some uh, photographers in there. You've got all of these people celebrating the ability to reach the Western Wall. And what you're hearing, Nomi Shemer singing, Jerusalem of Gold. And if you're familiar with this song, this is actually written prior to 1967 as part of a contest talking about this longing 
to be able to go back into the old city, to be able to go down to the Western Wall, to be able to go down to the Dead Sea by way of Jericho. And then 1967 happens, and all of a sudden, all of these things are possibilities that we can go to the Dead Sea by way of Jericho. We can walk through the empty alleyways of the old city. We can get down to the Western Wall. And if you look at the last stanza of her song, she writes that while still in the Sinai Desert, entertaining the troops, saying, once again, we were able to do these things. But that's not the end of the story for 1967. Go ahead and forward. What the Western Wall looked like, go ahead and click. Um, when we conquered it is this. We are standing up in the Jewish quarter, looking toward the east. So if you started the very background, you have the Mount of Olives. Over toward the right, you can see the graveyard. It's interspersed amongst those trees as well. At the top of that hill, the tallest spire, that is the Church of Ascension. If you move toward the left along that ridge line, you'll see that there are more open areas. There's actually another church over there, eventually reaching to Hebrew University and Hadassah Hospital, which were under Israeli control between 1948 and 67. This is where the incursion into the old city was actually staged from, was up on this ridge top. Coming now halfway through the photo toward the Western Wall, long dark wall right there in the middle. That is the Western Wall of the Temple Mount. All right, and then behind it, you can see the white platform of the Temple Mount. To the left is Al uh, sorry, the Dome of the Rock. To the right, Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is just off the picture. But now look at the foreground. This is the Mugrabi neighborhood. This is what the area that today we call the plaza looked like in 1967. There was about 10 meters, so about 30 feet between the Western Wall itself and the houses. So it essentially, it was just this alleyway that you could be in. And the decision is made that we want to provide access for multitudes. Next slide. So we are going to go in, we being the Israeli government in 1967. And again, it's complicated. There is a tremendous amount of conversation that can be said about this conversation. And you know, we can have that conversation, but I just kind of want to give you the pictures right now and the concept. We're going to go in and we're going to destroy, move, transplant the Mugrabi neighborhood so that we can create the plaza that is there today. So if you've been to the Western Wall, that's where you're standing now is when what used to be a plaza. Go to the next slide, please. Leaving for us. 1967. In 1967, there is a government call to come to the old city. Now in 1948, the last gate that Jews would walk out of is going to be Zion Gate. Those are the, the last Jews in the old city for 19 years. In 1967, the troops will come in both Lions Gate and Dung Gate, both of which are right next to the Temple Mount itself. But the government decides that there's a desire to kind of bring people to the Western Wall uh, for Shavuot, Matan Torah. And they put out a call to come to the Western Wall for sunrise. Okay, we don't want to miss that sunrise. It's all about that sunrise going back to the very beginning. We don't want to miss that. And what happens is all different kinds of people Jews from all over the city in the middle of the night walked to the, to the Western Wall and came into the gates. And you had the religious, and you had the secular, and you had the youth groups, and you had a few miscellaneous people who were in there as well. And on the right-hand side, there's a lonely palm tree that looks very sickly, and it was a lonely palm tree that is very sickly. And, but you can see a dirt ramp. That is what used to be Mugurbi Bridge. It was just a dirt ramp. Today it's replaced by an actual bridge. And the women's section of today is kind of on that side. And the men's section of today is on the left side. So that's 1967. 
What the government never expected is that this would become a thing. This is a, a government, you could even call it a political conversation, that today is almost a religious pilgrimage. So go to the next slide, please. This is what happens. Oh, sorry, there's more dancing. Forgot about that one on shovel morning. Now go to the next slide. This was a couple of years ago. All right, this year, I don't know yet what shovel looked like, but I do know that there were conversations, including amongst the Mitsorti movement and people who normally daven at the egalitarian section, that there was not going to be any davening this year um, because of the Mitsav, because of everything that is going on. But this is normally what the Western Wall looks like on shovel morning. And I can tell you the experience is one that is life changing because you leave your home with your family. And depending on where in Jerusalem you leave, you might leave at four o'clock in the morning, you might leave at three o'clock, depends on how long it takes you. And in the case of my family, the four of us left, it takes us about an hour to get there, an hour and 20 minutes to actually get all the way down. And we met up with friends about five minutes into the road and we were 10 and then we met up with other people and we were 40. And then by the time we got to um, Zion Gate, which is the gate closest to us, we were a mass of humanity. It was just Jews coming from all over the city, many of whom were dressed in white, some of whom are not, youth groups with, who are singing and dancing. And we go through whatever gate you're at, but in our case, we go through Zion Gate and we walk down the road to get to a mass of humanity. And it is a mass of humanity. And it's one of the very few times that I've ever seen Jews be quiet in mass. Because as it gets ready for the sun to peek over the mountains that are behind where that church, the Church of Ascension is, Mount Zion, like the energy changes. And it's this, this oh, look at all these people. All of these people are like, okay, it's almost there. It's almost there. It's almost there. And then... The sun peeks out and there's a half a second of silence because we can't be silent longer than that. There's this moment of silence where everybody's just looking at the sun. And then the polygon begins and all of these different groups break up and they begin to pray shacharit and all of the pieces that come. And then all of the secular Jews who were there as well, they're like, okay, we're here, we saw it, yay! Now let's go home and go to bed, eat breakfast and go to bed. So there's this movement that happens today, which is dramatic and stunning. And I highly encourage you to be here for the holiday of Shavuot. Shavuot so often gets kind of the short end of the stick when it comes to the pilgrimage holidays. You've got Pesach and, and, Shav and Sukkot, where you've got the Seder and the Sukkah. And there's all of these things that happen, and they're long. Shavuot, you have just a day. And here in Israel, it's just a day. But this really gives Shavuot that status of remembering why Shavuot is important. Remembering about the community. Remembering Matan Torah and the receiving of the Torah. And then... After that, we can go to the next slide. There is something else very important that we have going on in today's world. And, and that is, of course, is the dairy. And we're not gonna do a, a teaching on that, but if you go to the next slide, I actually just recently um, finished hiking as a tour guide. There's no tourism right here right now. So I took the opportunity to hike the 70 mile Shvila Golan Golan Trail. And this was what I was seeing as I moved down toward the end of the trail during that time. Now, wheat is typically harvested right around Passover and barley is typically harvested right around Shavuot. And that's about growing and weather and all of these other things. But the rabbis also, being the rabbis, they have to give us some meaning for this. And so what they say, I'm sorry, I, I did that backwards. Barley is harvested around Pesach and wheat around Shavuot. Barley, the rabbis say, is animal food. 
And typically, it's certainly in the ancient land, it seems like barley, it's rougher, it doesn't taste as good, it doesn't grind up as nicely. That's what you fed to your animals. And wheat was for people food. So what did they say? What is the whole purpose of the counting of the Omer is to help us move from our animal side to our humanity side. And we can really see that in the harvesting that happens and how the harvesting very much tells the story that we read all over the world. But seeing it here was very exciting to, to actually be able to see it on the ground. If you go to the next slide, because I can't help but talk about you know hiking in the land of Israel. This was actually just before Shavuot, uh, about, about a decade ago, when I was hiking Shvil Yisrael, which is the 600 mile trail that goes from the top of Israel to the bottom of Israel. And this for me was one of those aha moments. This is wheat being harvested just before Shavuot. And what you see the man in the corner doing, you can't see it very well from this picture, but the corner of the field was left unharvested. Now we are commanded to leave the corners of our field or anything that falls out the tractor or out of the truck in this, this case for the widow and the home and these other people who might need some food and can't afford to buy it. This man was actually in there with a sickle, with a curved sickle, and he was harvesting out the corner. He did not work for the company that was harvesting the field. He was bringing it up to just outside of Jerusalem where he was going to make food, uh, grain out of it and grind it into wheat so that he could make pitot to give to the poor. And this was this here we are 10 years ago, this commandment in action of preserving the payout for those people who might be in need of being provided some food. So there's one more slide because there's one other import. Oh, forget that slide. It's not a slide. It's real world. So you can turn that off because we cannot have shovel loaded without a little bit of cheesecake. Mine happens to be a tuxedo cheesecake with chocolate and, uh, and coffee there. Um, a little bit of life in Israel from the 1900s, the early 1900s through today, what happens on Shavuot? Again, you guys may know the news more than I do because you started Hag after I did. I don't know what happened um, last night, my time and how things went, but I will see that after the evening has concluded and we're able to move forward with our cheesecake and our other dairy products. And then into Sfirata Gomer, the counting of school being finished as we move toward summer. I wanted to just thank Flow Video and everybody for making this happen. And I hope that everybody is having wonderful sessions of learning and good food. And soon the sun will rise and Toro will be given to everyone who's not in my time zone where it rose quite a few hours ago. I wanna thank you guys and Shavuot Tov, sorry, Shavuot Tov and Chag Sameach. I wanted to just thank Flow Video and everybody for making this happen. And I hope that everybody is having Thank you so much, uh, Rabbi Estrin. And I learned from each of these presentations. My last all-nighter actually was my year in Israel when I walked to Robinson's Arch after a night of learning with the Schechter Institute and other places. And uh, I must say, all-night study is wonderful. It's exhilarating doesn't quite work when you have a 9.30 a.m. service the next day. You got to do a sunrise <laughs> service. But uh, um, I also learned about the white. I, I know about two uh, white parties, but I didn't realize about the white gatherings. It reminds me of my days at the seminary, show hopping on Simchat Torah a little. We didn't show hop on Shavuot, but we did show hop on Simchat Torah. And my yes. colleague, Rabbi Scott Hoffman, is on to do... Uh, an introduction. So good to see you, Scott. So good to see you, Ben. Can you hear me okay? I hear something in the background. All right, hold on a second. I'll, uh, I'll kill that. Hold on one second. I kill that one. Uh, hold on.
white gathers. Oh, can you hear me? Whoop. Yes. Now you can hear me. Okay, let me just see if you can see me too. Um, anyway, it's a great, first of all, thank you, uh, Ben, for being the host. And um, 